back everybody to our fall worship theme, Basic. It was developed as a small group study by Francis Chan. And it looks at some of the foundational recurring themes throughout the scriptures and asks the question and poses the challenge if we were to deeply follow these reoccurring foundational themes in the scriptures, how different would the church look today than it looks? And if you've been following through the last three weeks, you've seen the Trinity. God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we don't stand in the awesome presence of God and God's power, we don't recognize the lordship that God has over all things over our whole lives. The second week was follow Jesus. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and you don't do what I say? Certainly, the coming of Christ, his life, his ministry, his death and resurrection, his teaching and command to love God with our whole mind, heart, soul, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. If we do those things, we walk firmly in the footsteps of Jesus. We don't do it under our own power, and that was the third week with the Holy Spirit. We are given this gift of power, none like none in the world has ever seen. A power, a supernatural power in the power of the Holy Spirit, that as we step forward, following after God, miraculous and common things point to God's will and God's promise in the world. Today we take up the issue of fellowship, because just as we're not supposed to walk in our faith under our own power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit, we are also not meant to walk individually, but together. Teamwork. Who hasn't wanted to be part of a team? Now, I'm not just talking about a sports team, although that's a good illustration. Recently, there was this book, uh, I think the author, author is R.D. Rose, Born to be a Yankee. Has anyone read that book? It's about Derek Jeter. And in that book, it says, Derek Jeter, in the fourth grade, told his teacher that he was going to be a Yankee. And sure enough, less than a decade later, when he was 18 years old, he was signed as the starting shortstop for the New York Yankees. He played on that team his entire career, almost 20 years. Won four World Series? Four or five World Series? Five. Five World Series. Can you imagine, if you see this, can you imagine these, these sports folks holding up the jersey of the team they get recruited to? Imagine being recruited to the Yankees, if you're a Yankees fan. I'm not. It'd be horrifying if I was. <laughs> It'd be horrifying to the Yankees, too, because I'm going to good at baseball. I don't know. But we've had that experience. Right now, you, you could say that Derek Jeter had this passion to, to be a Yankee, and he invested himself and achieved that goal. And imagine achieving that goal. We've all had this kind of experience, maybe not with sports teams, but maybe you tried really hard to get into your college of choice. Maybe you tried really hard to work for your company of choice. Maybe getting involved in some kind of organization that really suits your perspective on the world. The feeling of joy and satisfaction of being part of something bigger than ourselves. Something powerful, something enduring, something with a reputation, something that defines us. It's a great feeling. And it's not by accident that it's a great feeling. It's because we're hardwired that way for teamwork, for communal living. We can get only so far individually and independently. But as a community, we can be more than any of us can be on our own. That's what this scripture is all about. <coughs> in fact, 1 Peter chapter 1 and then 1 Peter chapter 2, which is what we're in today, talks about being holy as God is holy. Now, we throw that word around in the church all the time, holy, 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 holy. What does holy mean when applied to 
the people of God, we're set apart. We're set apart. We're not set apart alone, though. We're set apart together as a community of faith, a group of people that reflect God's very own will, God's very own promise, God's very own love. We're defined by it. And so the scripture starts, Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. This is the foundational piece, no pun intended. This is the cornerstone piece. <coughs> Thinking of Christ as a foundational stone, as a cornerstone, is something that goes all the way back to Isaiah and all the way back to the Psalms, which is referenced in 1 Peter chapter 2, beyond where we read today. Isaiah 28, thus says the Lord God, See, I am laying in Zion a foundation stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Then Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. In order to know what team we are part of, what our team stands for, what's enduring about this team, what's powerful about this team, we have to look at what the team is built upon. And here it is, built upon Christ. Our mission statement here at St. Andrew says that very clearly. We are welcoming all to where Christ is the center. Everything is built upon Christ. That is what the church is supposed to be, and what 1 Peter 2 is telling. Come to us a living, come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals yet chosen and precious in God's sight. Rejected by mortals. Rejected by the world. We don't walk in the ways of the world, as the scripture tells us over and over and over and over again. And just as Jesus was rejected by the powers and the structures and the cultures of this world, so too the church stands outside of that. You know, the church spends a lot of time trying to attract people into the building. So we would be much better off trying to point people to Jesus. Because when people come to know Jesus, the church just builds on its own. Jesus is the center. And around that center, we come together. Like living stones, like these things that resemble this chief cornerstone, this foundational stone. And like living stones, the scripture says, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, set apart a priesthood, God's servants. To offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Holy and set apart. To offer spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual sacrifices in the New Testament is shorthand for a life of faith in action. In fact, Paul says it very well in Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your minds, so you may discern what is the will of God, good and acceptable and perfect. This day as we come to celebrate communion, commune, community, we remember and we celebrate not only the relationship that God has extended to us that we have through Christ, but also the relationship that 
we share together in Christ. And not just here in Tom's River, here in St. Andrew, but all who call themselves Christians. It's World Communion Sunday in the United Methodist Church, which celebrates the universal church. And that together we are on this team that is defined by God's power, God's mercy, God's love. We don't have to try out for that team. We just have to come because we're invited and live together expressing this. But our communion liturgy in the United Methodist Church points to this experience of doing life together. Holy are you, blessed is your son Jesus Christ, the liturgy goes. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set liberty for those who are oppressed, and to announce the time has come when you would save your people. By the way, that was Jesus' mission, and it's our mission as well. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners, and by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, gave birth to your church, God. Your church, this people. And in the prayer where we call upon the power of the Holy Spirit, during the communion liturgy it says, Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. That is our calling. That is our team. That is our purpose. Let's pray. God, we only get so far when we seek to be single people coming to you in faith. Our personal relationship with you is super important. But our relationship together with you as the community of faith is what fulfills us and carries us forward in this world reflecting. Dada! As we remember your mighty acts in communion this morning, we confess that often we've gone our own way. We've gone our own way from you. We've gone our own way from the church. And we come back now to celebrate and rejoice that we are part of something bigger together than we could ever accomplish on our own. Be with us in the power of your spirit and hold us together as examples of your love and your grace and your work in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.